Welcome everyone to the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. Today's South Talk, entitled Whiteness in Crisis, okay, is being co-sponsored by Southern Studies, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, as well as the Exploration Group for the Study of Race and Racism. And I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. James Thomas, or JT, who is the Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Mississippi and co-editor of Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. He's the author or co-author of five books and over 30 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and invited essays on the causes and consequences of race and racism in America and abroad. His research has been funded by the American Sociological Association, the National Science Foundation, and the Russell Sage Foundation and has been featured in popular media outlets like The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and Pacific Standard. JT is deeply dedicated to public scholarship, regularly writing for mainstream outlets like the Mississippi Free Press, serving on the boards of nonprofit organizations, and giving public lectures on race, racism, and inequality to academic and lay audiences alike. And today's reception I is uh, courtesy of the Russell Sage Foundation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Thomas. Hi. Um, I want to start with some gratitude. Uh, the research I'm sharing today would not have been possible without generous, generous funding from the National Science Foundation and from the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, the support from those two institutions has been really instrumental for collecting the data for this project. Um, but it's also allowed me to bring along four graduate students uh, for the ride. I don't get the chance to work with many graduate students with interests that are aligned with my own. So having Angie and Madeline and Aaron and Rondolin to not only help with the data collection and analysis, but to bounce ideas around with, to talk shop and so forth, that's been uh, really special for me. And so I'm thankful for each of them. I also want to give some gratitude to the places I've shared this work prior to today. Um, and then I want to give some gratitude to you all for uh, being here today when I share it with you now. Um, many of you are the first audience of Southern Studies scholars that I've had the opportunity to present this work in front of. So I am especially looking forward to the ways that you will push me to think even more deeply about this project. So about it. Tentatively, I'm calling this project Whiteness in Crisis and it has a question mark at the end. And that's because right now it's an open question for me. So what do I mean by whiteness and what do I mean by crisis? In this work, I'm defining whiteness as the historical and political system of racial classification that confers advantages to people socially defined as white. Whiteness is historical in that it emerged at a particular moment and in response to certain social conditions. Whiteness is political in that who counts as a white person has been subject to intense conflict and change over time. And whiteness is also normative in that whiteness has made the racial category white into the standard against which all other groups are held. There is this tendency, I think, in scholarship and popular writings to reduce whiteness to simply a matter of identity, of being a white person. Uh, in my view, this obfuscates whiteness's role in setting the terms and conditions for who counts as white in the first place. Whiteness is not something one is. Whiteness is a system within which one is embedded. So we can think of a racial identity then as this internal sense of attachment that a person has to a particular racial group and the relationship that that racial group shares with others. And there is, of course, an association between a person's racial identity and the racial category to which that person uh, is assigned, but it is not exact. Racial categories are an outcome of intense struggle, conflict, and change. And a person's racial identity flows from a system of racial classification that, like I said, is quite dynamic and at times unstable. So a person who identifies as white does so often by drawing from a dominant set of ideas and beliefs about what it means to be white in the first place. And what it means to be white in any given period is subject to all kinds of external forces. So by asking whether whiteness is in crisis, what I'm trying to do or what I'm trying to get at is understand what it means to be white in this new century, a period in which that normative system of racial classification is at the least less normative than it once was. Whiteness, in my eyes, appears to be going through something. 
And when I say that it appears to be going through something, what I'm referring to are large scale economic, social, and political changes and events across this new century. Many of these changes and events pose a challenge to this normative system of racial classification. Some of these changes and events disrupt how that normative system distributes advantages to those who are socially defined as white. And so my working theory here is that in this new century, when we as a nation seem to be careening from one crisis to the next, it's affecting how this normative system of racial classification functions. And it's affecting how white people are making sense of their dominant group status. My working theory is also that place plays an important role in how white folks are making sense of these times and what these times are doing to their sense of whiteness. That is, how white people make sense of whiteness is rooted in place. So what I'm gonna share with you today uh, is still a work in progress, uh, but it has a story that I think is starting to take shape. And that story is one about the relationship between race and place. And that story is set within the contemporary American South. It's a story about how white people are making sense of themselves within the context of a region whose own story has long been the subject of intense conflict and struggle. So if, as the historian Nell Painter says, being white these days isn't what it used to be, then this is also becoming a story about what being white these days is like for folks living in the American South, the place where whiteness in America was arguably seated and cultivated. And I found W.E.B. Du Bois's description of the wages of whiteness really helpful as I try to pull the thread through this entire project. Um, du Bois had argued that in the post-bellum period, there was little else other than the racial caste system to differentiate the conditions of white and black workers within the Southern plantation economy. And white workers, he argued, required some form of compensation, some guarantee that in this post-emancipation South, they were still white. And that guarantee, according to Du Bois, came in the form of what he described as a public and psychological wage. And as he writes, these wages of whiteness were paid in a variety of manner. Now, scholars following Du Bois have given a lot of consideration to this concept of wages of whiteness. I don't want to review all of that literature for you today. I cover a good chunk of it in the book project. But the key takeaway, I think, from that literature um, is that the work whiteness does for those defined as white has been remarkably consistent. 60 years after the civil rights movement, to be white in America today is still to have better access to healthcare, housing, schooling, employment, and so much more. So a 2020 report from the Nonpartisan Economic Policy Institute found that even after taking into account educational level, experience on the job and place of residency, white men's average hourly earnings were still 22% higher than those of black men, White women's average hourly earnings were nearly 12% higher than those of black women. And importantly, those gaps have widened, not narrowed over the past 40 years. White workers are more likely to be employed and less likely to be underemployed than black workers. And while almost 40% of black college graduates are in a job that does not typically require a college degree, that is compared with just 31% of white college graduates. Along with greater employment and income earning advantages, White people maintain enormous advantages in wealth. Most recently, the economist Alora Derenencourt and her colleagues used a really unique data set to estimate the ratio of white wealth per capita to black wealth per capita from emancipation to the present. And what they show, which is in this figure on the slide, is that given vastly different starting conditions under slavery, the, the convergence or the reduction of what we think of as the racial wealth gap that would remain a distant scenario even if wealth accumulating conditions had been equal across the two groups since, eman since emancipation, and we know that they were not. And like other colleagues who have examined the racial wealth gap across the 20th century, Durenin Court and her colleagues find that the racial wealth gap has also actually widened over the past 40 years, predominantly due to capital gains, which have, been, which have mostly benefited white households, um, and at the same time, income growth and savings have come to a halt for almost everybody. Meanwhile, across the medical and health industries, white people have significantly better access to health care than their black or Hispanic counterparts. White people are significantly more likely to have health insurance. When white people need to visit a doctor, they spend about 25% less time traveling to a doctor's office or health clinic. When white people arrive at the clinic, they spend significantly less time waiting for and receiving care. And a direct consequence of white people's advantages in healthcare access is that they also have better health outcomes. 
White people have far lower rates of chronic disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. White people also have significantly higher survival rates for the most common forms of cancer. Most importantly, and I think sobering about these advantages is how they translate into life and death. On average, white people live nearly four years longer than black people in America. And the gap is structured by place. People who live in neighborhoods where the share of black residents is 10% or greater have shorter lifespans than the national average. And in some American cities, those who are living in majority black neighborhoods have lifespans nearly nine years less than those who are living in the surrounding metro area. So when it comes to life itself, whiteness giveth and whiteness taketh away. And so long as whiteness remains normative, these wages that Du Bois had described almost 100 years ago, these wages appear so matter of fact as to be unremarkable. But my question is, what happens when these wages and the system that provides them are made to appear less normative? When they're rendered so visible and plain that to deny their significance is an increasingly difficult accomplishment. The first two decades of this new century have produced a remarkable visual remaking of the American social and political landscape. Despite gerrymandering, today's US Congress is the most, most ethnically and racially diverse in the nation's history. Nearly one in four congressional members today are not white. Compare that to 1945 when 99% of Congress was white. Meanwhile, the share of white people in the United States has declined significantly. Preliminary data from the 2020 census shows that white people now comprise just under 58% of the nation's total population. That's a decrease of six percentage points since just 2010. White people are just 47% of all younger people, people younger than 18. That's the first time in the history of the census that white people have not comprised a majority of this, uh, this demographic. Now, America's ruling class, of course, remains overwhelmingly white and male dominated. White people, especially white men, maintain control over most major American institutions, including mass media, education, and politics. At the same time, their visible domination within these institutions is subject to increased scrutiny. It's now echo echoed in ubiquitous calls for diversity, equity, and inclusion, or what we think of as DEI. Now, to be clear, many of these efforts to diversify America's institutions of power are hollow at best. Nevertheless, they do reflect an increased recognition that an entirely white executive board, leadership team, or conference panel is at least less normative than it once was. More importantly, the scrutiny over white people's continued dominant status does not end with demands for greater representation. The past two decades have borne witness to more regular, more public, and more critical challenges of whiteness than at any point since the civil rights movement. So what began in 2012 as a matter of fact assertion that black lives matter has grown into an international social movement that's mobilized millions against the racism that structures America's criminal justice system. And yet, Police violence against black men, women, and children persists even as anti-racist calls for action are mainstream, as demands for abolitionism are renewed among today's generations of scholars and activists. Public opinion, though, suggests that widespread circulation of graphic police violence, coupled with mass media coverage of protests, is having some effect on white folks, on how they think about the wages of whiteness and perhaps even their own relationship to those wages. So across this new century, multiple inflection points are increasingly pulling whiteness and its compensatory wages into full view. How white people are grappling with this moment in which their dominant status remains durable, yet also under intense scrutiny is an important question and it's the focus of my project. So the research that I'm gonna share with you today derives from an ongoing in-depth interview project of white Southerners who currently reside uh, in one of three Southern scenes, uh, Northwest Mississippi and Oxford in Lafayette County, Memphis, Tennessee, and Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, so far, we've completed a little over 100 interviews. Uh, we only have a handful remaining before we will end data collection. We used a two-step process to recruit people to participate. First, we sent pre-screeners in the mail to random lists of addresses, along with $2 in cash. And we used this pre-screener to identify white Southerners to speak with. Those who received our pre-screener were also notified that if they were chosen to speak with us, they'd receive an additional $25 gift card. So the intention with this two-step process is not to produce a statistically generalizable sample. It was, I'm much more interested actually in capturing what I think of as the full range 
of white Southerners and their experiences. So Oxford is the county seat for Lafayette County in Northwest Mississippi. It's best known, of course, as the home of this institution. Um, Memphis is the county seat of Shelby County, Tennessee. That is the fifth most populous city in the Northeast or the Southeast and among the nation's 30 largest metro areas. And then Cleveland is one of two county seats for Bolivar County located on the western border, border of Mississippi in its historic Delta region. The choice of these three sites was both pragmatic and conceptual. Uh, pragmatic in that I live and work here in Oxford, so I have easy access to these scenes and the people within them. But it's conceptual too in that there are important place-based differences and similarities between them that I think give us a important and also to date under-examined picture of white Southerners across the first decades of this new century. Like much of the South, these sites reflect a demographic makeup that is more black and more poor, but not necessarily less educated than the rest of the nation. Oxford and Cleveland, for example, have a higher share of residents with college degrees than the nation at large. And while Memphis's unemployment rate is significantly higher than that of the nation, Oxford's and Cleveland's unemployment rate is actually lower. Now, one could look at these comparisons and, and think that even within the American South, these three sites might be considered extremes. The South is, of course, poorer than the nation at large, but it's not as poor as any of these locations. And the South is home to more black people than any other region in the United States, but its share of black residents is not as high as any of these three sites. So what can studying white folks in these Southern scenes tell us about race and region or whiteness? I think without being cliche, I think it would be safe to say that history has a way of haunting the American South. Many sites that were once plantations are now prisons. In towns and cities all across the region, you have white marble men in Confederate uniform that still stand watchful guard over courthouses, public squares, and even college campuses. So how can the past be the past if it refuses to go away? Oxford, Cleveland, and Memphis, I think when taken together, give full shape and form to both Baldwin and Faulkner's observations. Each have borne witness to historical and contemporary white supremacist violence. Each have also served as important sites of black and white resistance to that violence, including efforts toward racial reconciliation. Bolivar County, where Cleveland is situated, was in the antebellum period among the 36 wealthiest counties in the nation. After emancipation, it became the site of a historically self-sufficient black community and organized and armed black resistance with networks that stretched all across the Mississippi Delta. Today, it's majority black and significantly impoverished. About one in three residents in Cleveland live in poverty. Uh, about one in six residents live in deep poverty, which is defined by the census as earning less than 50% of the federal poverty line. Meanwhile, though the US Supreme Court is widely thought to have dismantled school-based desegregation in 1954, Cleveland proves Baldwin and Faulkner's observations are more rule than, than exception. 60 years after Brown versus Board, a federal, George, federal judge finally ordered Cleveland's school district to consolidate its majority black and majority white high schools and end 50 years of local resistance. Many Americans also, of course, probably know Memphis as the city of Seoul, where in the 60s and 70s, hometown record labels like Stax and High helped launch the careers of dozens of black artists and entertainers, Otis Redding, Al Green, Isaac Hayes, the Staple Singers, Booker T and the MGs. Many Americans probably also know Memphis as the city in which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968 at the Lorraine Motel. Probably far fewer Americans know that one year prior to King's assassination in 1967, Memphis city leaders approved the construction of a Confederate monument built in the likes of Jefferson Davis to be installed in its Overton Park. That was funded by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the monument was erected in 1969. So the bracketing of King's murder by the elevation of one of the nation's most infamous traitors is more than just a bitter pill to swallow. I think it's informative and even clarifying about the place. Unlike Oxford or Cleveland, Memphis has experienced significant demographic transformation. At the time of King's assassination, Shelby County was actually majority white. Today, its racial demographics are inverted. Memphis has long sought to preserve its historic sound and civil rights efforts, much of which are distinctly and overwhelmingly black, but black owned businesses, black churches and black schools that were built and endured underneath the crushing weight of Jim Crow had far less luck or municipal support. So the people we've talked to so far across these three sites, they range in age from 18 to 88 with a median age of 48 years old. 
Uh, about two thirds of our sample identify as Christian, about one third attend church services at least once a week. They are on the whole more educated than the typical person from any of these three sites. Income is a bit trickier. We still need to do a deeper dive on their household status. Many of those we spoke with, not all, but many are in family units. They have partners, they also have children. If we take family income as the comparison, then the median income of our sample is just slightly less than the median income of white families in the South and a little bit less than the median income of white families across these three sites. But if we take it at the household level, then our respondents' incomes appear to be much higher than the median white household income in these three sites. But I think the range in the income levels is probably more relevant than the median. And the range is wide from as low as $13,000 per year to a reported million dollar a year income. About one in four respondents report incomes of $40,000 or less. Another one in four of our respondents report incomes of $150,000 or more. Now, while the white Southerners that we spoke with reside in one of these three places, many were born and raised in communities all across the American South, from large metro cities like Atlanta and Houston to small towns like Utah, Alabama and Melbourne, Kentucky. A few were born and raised outside of the American South, but later made it their home. And then others who were born in the South moved away only to return at a later date. So in this way, I think our sample really reflects the full range of white Southerners that's often missing in the literature on whiteness and certainly missing in more popular treatments of the region as a whole. The interviews we conducted center on how these white Southerners think about and make sense of themselves as white people living in the South today. We asked them to talk about the South, including what it means to them and whether the South has special significance to them in the communities they live in. We also asked them to reflect on their experiences with race across the life course. When they first noticed it, the kinds of conversations they had about race growing up in school and elsewhere, and the extent to which they think race has played a role in their lives. And then we also asked them to reflect on what it means to be white, whether they think there's anything significant about being white today or anything challenging or difficult about being a white Southerner specifically. And then we also asked them to talk about a whole host of events that they lived through. Some who were old enough to remember shared their experiences growing up during Jim Crow or attending newly desegregated schools. Others who were younger shared their memories of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina. Still others had more things to say about more recent events like the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the Trump presidency, and even the January 6 riots. For many, these experiences and these events seem to play a key role in how they think about whiteness and their relationship to it. We're calling these anchoring events because for many of those we spoke with, these experiences and these events seem to play a key role in anchoring how they think about whiteness and their relationship to it. So what are we finding so far? Among the folks we spoke with, their sense of whiteness, their sense of themselves as white is broadly stitched to the region that they call home. Walter is 38 years old. He's raised, born and raised in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Walter attended public school in Clarksdale, which he says gave him a different perspective on race than many other white kids in his community. In Clarksdale, he explains, most of the white kids attend the private school, which began as a segregation academy for white children in the post-Brown era. Walter, however, attended the public school. Looking back, he tells us, I don't know many people that grew up in the time that I did that would think as a white male, you weren't given the benefit of the doubt in every possible scenario. Walter's first recollection of race as something that has social weight in his life was as a child playing youth baseball. In Clarksdale, he told us, we had different Little League baseball teams. There was one on our side of town and one on the other side of town. Black kids played in one and white kids played in the other. Even the black children who lived in Walter's larger neighborhood played at the ballpark and in the league across town. Occasionally, however, the children in his neighborhood would organize a small baseball game during the summers. There he met black children who played in the other all black league and he recalled asking them which team they play for and not understanding that they didn't play in the same league as him, even though they grew up in the same neighborhood as him. Like his schools, his recreational activities were also structured through race and place. And the structuring of race, these unwritten rules were remnants of a racial caste system that did not die out. And in this small Mississippi Delta community, those rules played out in sharp relief. As our conversation unfolded, Walter relayed to us a sense of the relationship between race and region 
we found across many of our other conversations. I think it's a complicated time to be a white Southerner, he said. Walter believes that in the South especially, the advantages of being white are, quote, baked way into the pie. He recalls, for example, that while his public school in Clarksdale was majority black, the only children who competed in the school science fair were white. Walter is a research scientist today, and he attributes his early participation in the science fairs at school as one factor in his chosen career. And he wonders aloud, too, whether black kids in his own school, in his own neighborhood, were granted the same opportunities as him. The wages of whiteness are, of course, structural, but they're more than just structural. They're so baked into the pie, as Walter put it, that they become routine, mundane, even ordinary. But these wages are also legible to Walter. And because they're legible, they lead him to wonder aloud whether he has an obligation to do something to address them, even if he can't really articulate what that must be that he should do. Dorothea is a 54-year-old woman originally from Houston, and she expressed similar concerns. Her family history includes slaveholders in Mississippi. And nearly 160 years after emancipation, Dorothea tells us, I still carry that baggage. And as she put it, this baggage is carried by many other white Southerners whose family history also includes enslavers. Dorothea says, I think there's a lot of guilt that white Southerners carry around. But as she tells us in her very next sentence, it doesn't necessarily affect our opportunities. So in Walter's own words, white Southerners like he and Dorothea are wrestling with questions like, am I doing enough? Should I do more? What can I do? What should I do? What is my responsibility? And I think that's in no small part because of the clarity with which Walter, Dorothea, and others can see the wages of whiteness in place. Now, there's a delicate balance we need to strike here in how to interpret what these folks are saying. One of the more common criticisms of interview methodology is that what people tell you may not correspond all that well to how they act. And this is, of course, also a drawback to survey research. But I think it also maybe mistakes the purpose of an interview. The interview is not a search for objective truth. It's a tool to better understand how people make sense of themselves and their lives. It's a way to get at how a person puts together a story about who they think they are and who they think they are in relationship to other people. So I don't think it's a good idea to put full faith in what Walter or Dorothea express as a desire to do something about the wages of whiteness. At the same time, I don't think we ought to dismiss their worries as insignificant or somehow untruthful. I find Baldwin's thoughts on white anguish, anguish from the fire next time especially clarifying. Baldwin writes that a large part of the problem of the continued significance of the color line has to do with white people's profound desire not to be judged by those who are not white, to not be seen as they are, as he puts it. At the same time, Baldwin writes, a vast amount of white anguish is rooted in white people's equally profound need to be seen as they are, to be released from the tyranny of the mirror. When the white folks we interview describe whiteness as a kind of baggage, as Dorothea does and as many others do, when white folks like Walter wonder aloud whether they're doing enough, I think we need to treat those statements as part of their ongoing sense-making project about what it means to be white in these times and in the South in particular. Now, the extent to which respondents acknowledge, deny, or feel uncertain about white advantages helps us think about how they're making sense of these times they live in, and the extent to which the extant crises of the 21st century are bringing some of those advantages along with scrutiny of them into focus. Um, in Racism Without Racists, Eduardo Benia Silva, the sociologist, has argued that for whites to maintain their dominant group status uh, after the civil rights movement, a new racial ideology was necessary, one that was mo more covert, but no less effective in justifying or rationalizing white people's material advantages. And many other scholars since have also argued that in this post-civil rights era, white Americans often draw upon this new ideology of colorblindness to explain away their persistent material advantages. A number of scholars across the social sciences have documented the prevalence and persistence of colorblind attitudes among white people in general and within specific social settings like schools and colleges, the workplace, and many others. Um, today, it is arguably, colorblindness is arguably the most empirically supported theory of contemporary racism within sociology. Now, I wanna be clear here. I'm not gonna suggest that those scholars are wrong. I do think colorblindness is a dominant ideology. I also think it's contextually dependent. 
In our interviews, we do find respondents deploying colorblind frames as they try to make sense of whiteness and race in the South. And yet, that's not all we find. In fact, it's not even mostly what we're finding. Wanda is 70 years old. She grew up in a working class household outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Neither of her parents ever finished high school and both worked at a factory. I promise you it wasn't very much, she tells us of her upbringing, but we always had enough, never did without anything. Wanda herself only completed high school. Today she works as a realtor where she's had some success, but less so now, she says, because of her age. Wanda voted for Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020 and describes her politics as conservative. When Wanda was in the eighth grade, her all-white high school was merged with the all-black high school in her community. And she recalls this period as one of heightened anxieties and even violence. I can remember there being a lot of fights out in the schoolyard, things like that, she says. By her 10th grade year, she noticed white flight happening in her neighborhood. If black people moved into your neighborhood, the white people moved out, she says. On our street, there was a rental house next door to us and some black people moved in. Well, not the next week or the next month, but the next day, my daddy found us a rental house in a white neighborhood and we moved in. Wanda doesn't have pleasant memories of this time. In her mind, her father disrupted her life. It was one of the first moments in which she recognized how race matters. Speaking of her parents, she tells us, they never taught me to hate anybody else. But, she says, I saw that as soon as black people came in, they were out of there. That was huge in my memory. I wanted to stay where I was at. In our interview with Wanda, we also asked her, like we asked everybody else we spoke with, to reflect on what it means to be white. I'm afraid to be honest, she told us, so we gently encouraged her, and this is what she said. I mean, I just have to be honest. I feel like there is maybe not better opportunity, but more opportunity. I wish I didn't feel that way. I just feel like it's a hard, hard world out there, and I think it's harder for black people, no matter how smart, no matter what position. Wanda's acknowledgement of the advantages that whiteness affords her was common across our interviews. About three quarters of our respondents acknowledge so far that being white comes with a certain set of advantage. Another 14% express uncertainty, less than 15% deny it outright. Now, importantly, and this is another great thing about interviews, we find that some of our respondents hold more than one view. That's why I said that colorblindness is contextually dependent. Toby is a 32-year-old man from Memphis. At one point, he tells us he can't think of any specific advantages he himself has on account of his white racial status. I'm not sure, he says, but as we talk more, he reflects upon living in Memphis. I can definitely see where there would be privilege, he says, especially with economic inequality and things like that. You see it all the time, especially growing up in Memphis. The black communities were incredibly poor for the most part. Our respondents' reflections on the wages of whiteness has some association with their political ideology. Those who identify as liberal or moderate are more likely to acknowledge the advantages that are conferred by whiteness. But a clear majority of those who identify as conservative also acknowledge these advantages. Even among those who identify as very conservative, they are more likely to express uncertainty than to deny those advantages outright. Gail is a 56-year-old conservative woman she tells us at first she doesn't think she's personally experienced advantages on account of being white. If she's received better treatment, she says, it's because I do a better job or work harder. At the same time, however, Gail tells us, I think I've probably seen white privilege, but I think it's getting better because of protests and attention to things that have happened in the past. So again, she's grounding them in these extant crises of this new century. It makes you uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable feeling to think that I've had white privilege. It makes me uncomfortable. So in her own words, the wages of whiteness are real, even if they don't apply to her, and they're getting better, but only because of increased scrutiny. And that scrutiny creates for her an uncomfortable feeling. Now I began by telling you all that place matters for how race matters. And so far I've tried to show that how these folks think about whiteness is stitched to the South. I've also tried to show that for these folks, whiteness is quite legible. They're not colorblind in the sense that they do acknowledge the advantages that whiteness affords them. But what's making whiteness legible? In our interviews, we asked these white folks to reflect a bit on what it means to be a white Southerner, whether there's anything important or significant about that status, and whether there's anything they think is challenging or difficult about that status. And as expected, we received a range of responses. 
but I think those responses reveal how their sense of the South and their relationship to the South informs how they think about whiteness. Patsy is 38 years old. She's from Lula, Mississippi, a small town in the Delta. She was raised by her mother, an accountant. She remembers them struggling financially when she was a child. Maybe she didn't always make what she was worth, Patsy says of her mom. So there were times that we really struggled. Today, Patsy works as an attorney for the state of Mississippi. Patsy has a strong sense of Southern identity, even though she describes the region and Southern identity itself as conflicted. In the South, she says, people in the region come to be defined by their worst parts. We asked Patsy to reflect upon being a white Southerner, and this is what she told us. Lula is a town now of about 200 people. It was about 400 when I was a kid. We were one of the few white families, and so I could see from birth how I was treated different. The opportunities I had were different. I've always been aware of privilege, especially in the South, though it exists throughout the United States. When I travel abroad, it's obvious, but in the South, you know, it's shouted out loud. She continues, I recognize that I live a fairly safe life. You know, even when we struggled when I was a kid, I never got close to poverty. I've seen what it looks like. I've been its neighbor, but it's never been in my house, and part of that is because my mom is white. When I was born, my dad was actually in jail. He was arrested for a white collar crime and convicted and was in the Shelby County Jail. How many kids from the Delta growing up with a single mom whose dad was in jail when they were born end up being a lawyer? Not a lot, and that's because my mom was white. Tanya is 68 years old, retired, and currently living in Memphis. She agreed with Patsy's sense that in the South, the wages of whiteness are shouted out loud. She tells us, and she's very articulate, the tragedy of race seems even more intractable and deep-seated in the South than it does elsewhere. At the same time, Tanya sees the South and what she calls the tragedy of race as structuring the country as a whole. She says, unfortunately, some of the worst aspects of racism in the South are now moving into the national level instead of remaining here. Later on in our interview, she elaborates on that point. When I was young, in the South, it was quite acceptable among whites to be openly and brutally racist. By the time I got to college, this would have been in the mid-1970s, it began to be impolite. It didn't necessarily mean that the feelings are going away, but you no longer said things, you no longer made comments, and people began to learn to talk about things and use euphemisms like urban, words like this. So white people would say things in a more polite and somewhat gentle way. What I've seen in the last few years is that that restraint where, you know, maybe I feel a certain way, but I'm not gonna inflict it on anybody, that seems to have failed us. And people are saying things again that I really did not think I was going to hear again. And I guess I was naive enough to think that if you layer something over long enough with politeness, eventually maybe it'll go away. And now I have to certainly rethink that. And I think that this is happening all over the country now. Tanya's response suggests that what I described very generally at the beginning as these times, the last two decades of this new century are a period in which, in which white folks like Tanya and others are increasingly having to confront the enduring qualities of whiteness. And in this instance, they're doing so against the active backdrop of the South, where the tragedy of race, as she called it, has been brought to the center stage of our national climate. Tanya, like others we spoke with, is now having to rethink ideas and beliefs she held about racial progress. Daryl is 42 years old and his family has lived all over the South. His dad was in sales. He attended Charlotte, North Carolina public schools in the late 80s and early 90s and recalls the very public struggles Charlotte faced in trying to desegregate its schools through mandatory busing. Politically, Daryl tells us he's libertarian and describes himself as a middle of the road conservative. He's also a military veteran. His second day uh, in military service was 9-11. He says he's seen firsthand the inside of government and is concerned about its size and scope of reach in his private life. Now, during our conversation, we asked Daryl a question we ask nearly everyone we interview. Does he think the South is a place where a person's race still plays a role in shaping their opportunities in life? And this is what he tells us. In daily life, I don't think about that because I'm white. But if I do think about it, then yes, very much so. Everything from being screened for jobs based on how your name sounds. I taught in public education for five years in Mississippi's public education system. And I've seen the full gamut of everything. You know, I do have this internal dialogue, this struggle with thinking about what's systemic and what's cultural, what's, I don't know, political. 
what's active oppression, what's passive. So I don't know. But I think race in the South is a determining factor. Now here, when Daryl is trying to make sense of what is systemic and what is cultural or what's active versus passive oppression, we understand him as grappling with the extent to which racism is a matter of just a few bad apples or whether it's baked into the entire pie, as Walter put it earlier. Is it because of direct discrimination that happens when an employer refuses to hire a black person or is it more systemic like with policing? I think Daryl's response also brings into sharp focus the agency of white people in reproducing as well as challenging colorblindness. Scholars who study and describe colorblindness often refer to its routineness. It consists of habitual and somewhat unintentional routines by ordinary actors who reproduce racial inequality through business as usual and with the support of colorblind language and discourse. Daryl does acknowledge some of this. He doesn't think about race in his life most days because as he says, whiteness makes it so that he doesn't have to. And yet if and when he does think about it, he can't help but acknowledge it. Daryl's response illustrates how he and others, I think, are thinking about place and its relationship to, the, to race. And the South is the place where if Daryl thinks about it, race still matters. Now, Daryl's response is also quite muddy, but that muddiness is important. And it would be difficult to show that muddiness outside of an interview context. Daryl is most clear, however, when he says that the South is a place where race still determines someone's life chances. The South is not a metaphor for Daryl. It's not benign backdrop for Daryl. It's central for how he and other folks we are talking with are making sense of whiteness and the advantages that it affords in these times. I'm gonna wrap up for you in just a second. This project is ongoing. There isn't much of a conclusion yet to be made, but I'm gonna to try to make one. And I think the main takeaway is what I said toward the beginning. The evidence we've gathered so far strongly suggests that place matters for how race matters. And the broader literature suggests that few places seem to matter as much within the American imaginary as the American South. And the contemporary American South seems to be the site where the current state of whiteness, including public challenges to its normative status, is put in sharp relief. Robin D.G. Kelly writes that within America's collective imaginary, the South is a metaphor that obscures as much as it reveals. And popular imagery of the South has long trafficked in tropes of a remote and backward landscape that is riddled with the corpses and other remnants of the nation's original sin. I think the truth reveals far more than those tropes let on. It is true that the South is the nation's most rural region. It is also the, its most populous. Nearly 40% of the entire country lives below the Mason-Dixon line. And that number is increasing. In the last two decades, only the American West rivals the growth of the American South. Not only is the South the nation's most populous region, it's also among its most racially diverse. Relative to the country at large, the South is more black and increasingly more brown. And yet, the South is also the most white. More than 70 million white people reside in the South today. That is nearly 20 million more than any other region. Now in the 1970s, television shows like the Beverly Hillbillies and films like Deliverance cast the South as this impoverished, undereducated, and even illiterate space and on the one hand, the South is home to the largest number of adults with less than a high school diploma. On the other, it's also home to the largest number of adults with professional or doctoral degrees. The South is America's most impoverished region though. It's 17 million poor people make up nearly 42% of all poor people in the country. The South in the 21st century is the most politically conservative region and it's most religious at the same time Many of the ideas and values that are historically linked to the South, the emphasis on law and order, the Second Amendment, states' rights, Christian nationalism, even white supremacy itself, will these now broadly define America at large? So in my mind, I offer these details as an entry point to how we might think about the South as a place, perhaps the place from which to understand the contested and contentious qualities of whiteness today. Howard Zinn famously described the region uh, as the nation itself, but on steroids. And since the nation's birth, the South has played host to some of America's most monumental battles, genocidal violence against indigenous people, the institutionalizing of chattel slavery. The South is the crucible within which America's color line was conjured. From reconstruction to the reign of terror that followed its failure, the South continued to serve as the nation's stage where the drama of the color line would unfold. And in these first decades of this new century, the South is where America's most violent and tragic dramas are still staged.
Today, the American South is the site where detention centers for child migrants are both built and hotly contested, where Confederate Heritage Month is still proudly proclaimed each year by state governors, and yet also where local communities openly contest the public spaces still occupied by tributes to the Confederate dead. It's where in Montgomery, Alabama, the site of a former slave warehouse is now a museum of black history, just a football field's length from a former slave auction site where tens of thousands of enslaved black folks were once trafficked and less than half a mile from the nation's only memorial to its more than 4,000 lynching victims. So the region's complexity is really only exceeded in my mind by its continued relevance. There is no other place in America that best captures our nation's most tragic conditions and the sheer force through which many struggle to overcome them. And as the problem of the color line continues to serve as this century's primary concern, just as it was in the last, no other region seems to be so remarkably shaped by it as has the South. So the South then is where I think scholars of race, of whiteness, and even of social change should turn if we want to understand these enduring qualities of whiteness, as well as the apparent contradictions within them. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. I welcome your questions and your feedback.